We must speak the truth about terror. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves. Take your own advice. What happens? I tell you what happens. Blam! I have a window that looks directly at the World Trade Center, and I saw... No collusion! Shit's get way too complicated for me. Welcome to The Antidote. This is Greg McCarran. This is Jeremy roth All right, Jeremy, this is our first recording of 2023. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, obviously, we're a little bit behind the curve of this new year, 2023, but I feel like 2022 was an interesting year. It was difficult in many ways, um, f- sort of productive, um, but I'm happy to be in 2023, and I'm very happy to be back at it with you, Greg, and uh, we have a lot to deal with. Yeah, I, I definitely concur with that, um, with that sentiment. And uh, we've got a lot to get into together here is uh, certainly things are going to be, uh, you know, 2023 is going to be a year where um, there's going to be you know, some things are going to be picked up on here, including uh, once again, entering into another uh, American uh, presidential primary process. And we'll get to that as the year goes on. But uh, we've got a few topics to talk about here. This is going to be a bit of a roundup slash analysis on a few topics that have been on our radar and uh I'd like to start jeremy with this uh the new the new congress which is going to be uh, of course with kevin mccarthy as house speaker after 15 failed votes and um uh the the i guess this uh this group around matt gates has got a lot of influence now and matt gates in particular um jeremy you directed me to an interview uh matt gates on uh the tim cast with tim pool and uh, luke radowski and company and um it was very interesting and i think it might have been a glimpse into uh what we can elements of what we can come to expect from this new congress which is going to be um much more obviously to the quote unquote right, but then also I we believe uh, with much more of a foreign based um, uh, um, backing to it in terms of the uh, both from a well, it's going to be different from both a domestic perspective as the people the the I believe credibly accused um, elements of Congress that were uh, when it comes to January sixth and the uh, of course the the storming of the Capitol, the Capitol insurrection, the Capitol coup attempt uh, are in positions of uh, prominent influence, including uh, Scott Perry, the head of the Republican, um, the, the House Freedom, quote unquote, caucus, who was uh, subpoenaed after a chain of events, including spreading theories about um, votes being switched in Italy, I believe, and the, the mess that comes with that, uh, borderline hammer scorecard type stuff, huh? And then um, the... Uh, with people like that having a lot of influence in the new Congress, and then combined with what we see is uh, there's definitely a foreign element to this. Uh, um, you might even call it ultra MAGA, which is the term that the now no longer in Congress, uh, Madison Cawthorn, who may or may not have been actively influenced by Russian active measures while he was uh, approached by a Russian um, in a visit he made to Russia a number of years ago. But um, yeah, but, I mean, by so, the by the way, Greg, like the we seem to sort of skip over these like multitudes of these background stories like where where everywhere from like the sort of go to of like the alt left and russian state media for describing the american you know uh, veteran security perspective on russia's invasion of ukraine scott ritter's background uh, of uh, not only how they, they they never discuss the background of any of the whether it's like redacted tonight uh, you know uh, lee uh, What's his name? Uh, the comedian uh, Lee, Camp, Lee. Lee Camp, who has him on, or, or and for sure not on like the uh, Democracy Now of Russian state media, the Fault Lines program. They never discuss the actual, the very obvious details of this compromat background of someone like Ritter, where it goes back all the way to. Uh, questions of, uh, you know, he's been, he was indicted. I think he was convicted or he at least pleaded out um, guilty to uh, soliciting uh, underage uh, girls on the internet. Uh, um, turned out to be a police agent in that case, but it's not only one. I think it's, it's a pattern uh, in that case, but it's also his, the fact that he met his wife uh, as, a, as a young Russian translator and uh, I've been reading, I actually finished uh, the book by Bob Bear about the fourth man. 
that begins to describe in an, a still open investigation, uh, counterintelligence investigation to a, a very high level, long term uh, Russian intelligence, prior Soviet intelligence mole at uh, the highest levels of uh, uh, CIA counterintelligence. And, uh, and there's a lot missing, of course, from that, as Bob Baer usually would uh, do. He was open to entertaining conversation I had with him outside of the Hammer Museum. Remember Armand Hammer Museum? Wish I'd known uh, then what I know now about the background there of the side of it. But he was willing to entertain uh, questions about the white vans on September 11th uh, celebrating uh, Israelis apparently prepositioned uh, in place for the big wedding 9-11 operation to start in the New York uh, area, um, but always some kind of limited hangout and a red herring about what about Iran's role in 9-11 and, and uh, all, of, all of that. And sort of I feel like he's evolved in certain ways, but also still stagnates in terms of for some reason, covering up some core aspects. Like never, he seems to run cover for the question of Angleton, how Angleton's main guy in the special investigations group, Claire Edward Petty, uh, who, when he went through years and years and boxes and boxes and you know, filing cabinets full of the very, very secret uh, counterintelligence information, looking for the monster plot mole that Angleton and then I believe his sort of uh, sent a uh, provocateur, actually, sort of like helpful tool provocateur, Anatoly Golitsyn, uh, you know, uh, basically um, looking for the uh, monster plot mole. Claire Edward Petty, his main go-to guy who he said to go find him, turns around and after looking at all these documents and all these timelines and everything like that, says... 80 to 85 percent chance Angleton himself is the mole that somehow he's never found after years and years and years of basically debilitating uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the search for uh, Soviet counterintelligence penetrations uh, and all that. And Bear is totally blind uh, about even the fact that these things were even brought up in relationship to Angleton and the allegations there. And that you would think that if this there was this key high-level mole in uh, in the CIA in the 80s is the main timing when there was seemed to be major uh, indications of uh, of, a, of a major penetration that you know Angleton gets ushered out the door uh, probably sort of strong armed it looks like by Bill Colby as Colby comes in after Jesse Helms who seemed to protect Angleton. Uh, to some extent, and uh, and then then Colby seems to use the Seymour Hirsch uh, articles about Angleton's role in domestic CIA operations and things like MH Chaos and Angleton uh, snooping on people's American mail. Uh, and by the way, nothing ever found allegedly in any of this in terms of you know Soviet influence in in, in American mail. Uh, so uh, you, over and over you see a pattern there. And so Colby seems to strong arm Angleton out uh, in the wake of the uh, Seymour Hirsch uh, journalism, public journalism. And then, in, in the, you know, in the immediate decade after there, you then have the apparent rise of this new high level uh, CIA mole. And Bear does not connect the dots at all. He doesn't even make the bridge from the earlier question. Remember Philby, Kim Philby, you know, seen as maybe the arch uh, Soviet mole in the entirety of the West. Still questions about the missing person in the Cambridge uh, spy uh, circle. And the very uh, powerful uh, allegations have been made by uh, Roland Perry. His book, the um, the Fifth Man, I think it's called. So you have the Bears, the Fourth Man, and Roland Perry's the Fifth Man. In that case, he says that it was Victor Rothschild. And Philby, as we pointed out, there's this whole background there, obviously, where Philby was a, a Zionist agent before he was identified as a Soviet agent and appears to have even played a very potentially crucial role in very likely, I would say, the counterintelligence part of the, uh, of the uh, King David Hotel bombing. Remember, the King David Hotel bombing, which is like the modern act of terror that not only launches the the modern uh, age of terrorism, remember not Menachem Begin, 
you know, uh, Israeli prime minister uh, in a conversation with a journalist said it was asked, how does it feel to be the, um, the, the father of terrorism in the Middle East? And Menachem Begin replies, in the Middle East, in the whole world, right? These are, this is the architecture of the leadership in the, in the Israeli state. And that, that, you know, that Uber moment is obviously the King David hotel bombing. And the target is a British, you know, a British uh, administrative uh, installation, basically, at the King David Hotel and uh, seen as a, quote unquote, justified military target because of the, of the British mandate and uh, the British were, uh, you know, not uh, evacuating as quickly as they wanted, not giving the Zionists uh, everything that they wanted. And, and so then the Ergun and the Stern Gang, Lehi, uh, and others, I think the Palmach, uh, you know, all of these proto-Israeli, uh, you know, some call terrorists, others call freedom fighter groups, uh, become the Israeli military and intelligence services. Many go on to become prime minister. And, uh, and obviously the sort of the, the arch hypocrisy at the core of the birth of the Zionist state is, is the King David hotel bombing. Because not only because it's terrorism against an, you know, there's, it's a civilian civilian infrastructure you could say it has military overtones and in some way but it's a civilian target and then there's also jews right so then this whole fraud of that zionism is here in order to create a state to protect jews there they show in their originating act that they are willing to sacrifice even jews or, or maybe most especially jews i don't know but they're definitely willing to sacrifice the Jews uh, and definitely civilians of all sorts and, and British, uh, you know, people of, of all sorts uh, in order to, uh, to create their state. And so Philby, Angleton's closest friend, not only his closest friend, but in many ways, it looks like Philby was the man who taught Angleton really the sophisticated ins and outs of counterintelligence uh, as a craft. And then Angleton is then said to be the maestro of American counterintelligence, sits at the head there at the desk of U.S. counterintelligence for two decades, I think at least. And then at the same time, he's controlling the Israel desk. And then the, the question pops up is, is he the highest level Soviet mole that he says he's looking for and somehow just disrupts the entire sort of Western uh, relationship of intelligence services in the, in the looking for it while also, uh, you know, basically uh, putting, driving the American counterintelligence into a ditch at the same time. Um, and Philby has this very same kind of structure. There's a Zionist question. And Philby plays this key counterintelligence operative role in terms of the King David Hotel bombing, it looks like. He's, he's the one who's pointing British intelligence uh, towards, I believe, Lebanon uh, at the same time as I would say very likely he was at the very least being used as an asset to, to uh, soften the target for the, uh, the Zionist terrorists of the King David Hotel. So that's before... He be, Philby becomes the no, most notorious uh, Soviet spy in the Western world. And basically he's in many ways seen as like the, at least the prince, if not the originator of like the real crucial aspects of the institutionalized uh, British counterintelligence uh, system. So that's just hanging there also in the back, background of... Uh, of um of Angleton. Okay, so all right, so that that's a long aside to sort of give some background of all of these like missing espionage pieces, deep politics pieces uh, of things that then pop up in very obvious ways in terms of contemporary 21st century indications of compromise. Everyone from Scott Ritter's uh you know um uh background of where how he met his real young translator uh, Russian wife when he was uh, in uh, in the Soviet Union um, doing arms control uh, at the time. And the reason I bring that up is that in one of the things that's talked about in Bob Bear's Fourth Man book is that this was well known. This was sort of go-to uh, tradecraft uh, of, of uh, Soviet intelligence was young, pretty translators, women, to uh, cultivate the uh, Americans and others. I'm sure 
coming uh, to the Soviet Union. Okay, and so this just uh, happens to be then the woman that Ritter like marries and and all of that. And so th- that when you combine that with what you brought up of like you know of what's going on in the background of uh, uh, what's his name you, uh, you you talked about for who just left Congress with this question. Oh. Madison Cawthorn. Madison Cawthorn's wife. What happened there? Or the uh, co- the founder of Parlor uh, ends up creating Parlor after he meets this uh, Russian woman who's in the country, and then they go back and they have their marriage, and uh, and they, his the his mother in law, who's seen as a you know a cultivator of the Russian state, she's like a. Um, gets, uh, gets them a a, a Russian uh, institutional building for I think for their marriage and all of that, and none of that is sort of just put front and center in terms of what is going on. Questions at the very least in terms of what is Parler, uh, then and then of course then it ends up being put on Russian servers or at least with Russian state access and and, and all of that. So there's just a, there's just a replete landscape of these now very almost like crude kind of indications of uh, modern compromat uh, in terms of some of these figures like you talked about in Madison Cawthorn is like the guy who sort of like we're going to take back ultra maga from the bidenites and we're going to we're going to use dark maga we're going to go dark maga now uh, and this is just the tip of this uh, the iceberg of this landscape Indeed, it is. Uh, one thing that's going to stay true in 2023 is uh, that the antidote is where you come for the come for the info and stay for the tangents. That's one thing about us that uh, you can that we definitely are very uh, very very well versed in, um, in tangents. But hopefully, uh, hopefully everybody gets uh, something out of the out of the information. Come for the info, stay for the tangents. But uh, but you're right. And uh, the thing with uh, Cawthorn is that we'll I'll provide links for uh, the the story around Madison Cawthorn and his. Uh, and his wife and being invited to what he described as a fake CrossFit competition in Russia and uh, and all that uh, goes along with that. And then also links about uh, Scott Perry and exactly what was uh, going on with him in the um, lead up to the January 6th now in a now overseeing the House Oversight Committee, which basically oversees the uh, process of government and checks and balances and over oversights. I mean, that's the head of the House Freedom Caucus who um, was subpoenaed for uh, or things we'll, we'll provide links to that and and by the way greg who does uh you know after this very interesting trade of Brittany griner for victor boot uh who does victor boot come home as a hero to uh, sit down with the, the very immediately uh, previous hero maria butina who became a sort of uh, uh, an archetype, right, of the Red Sparrow type of, uh, you know, she's hanging out with everyone, she's hooking up with everyone, she's with the highest levels of the NRA, she's uh, she's with everybody, she's with Rick yeah, Santorum, you, yeah. He sent me a picture of all, like, uh, of, of um, Maria Butina with some of the people she was uh, photographed palling around with from Wayne LaPierre of the NRA to Sheriff David Clark to Rick Santorum, and I jokingly said, Rick Santorum, say it ain't so, <laughs> to uh, Donald Trump Jr. was photographed with her as well in that series of photographs. And by the way, Rick Santorum, I believe, also was on uh, the Tim Pool uh, show uh, in he was uh, 2022. The, uh, yeah, he was at the CPAC um, Global Global Culture War Family Values Conference in Hungary as well. Was that a schlap schlong fest? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. And um yeah, yes, it was. Yeah, and that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother can of worms. Yeah, that. but do a comp compromat as a as a key thing here, and I, I know I know that I imagine people feel like why does Jeremy like obsess about this Russian thing and that kind of thing? It's partially because there's so much there that is almost unknown, and in terms of including that whole background of Angleton and Philby and. Rothschild, which needs to be really dealt with, but all the way to the current moment of where we're now dealing with a 9-11 in the case of the 11-9 operation. But this time, it's totally denied that it even happened, that it's being called by everyone, you know, across the the sphere of this denial aspect, you know, from the right to the left of it's a conspiracy theory that there was anything there. And not only was there, there much more there in terms of even Russian state involvement and long-term cultivation of not only Trump, but this whole network surrounding him of someone like Flynn is like just the sort of most obvious 
uh, piece of uh, of that coming into the administration. But it's also even wider in terms of the international and the domestic components and the the Council for National uh, Policy uh, components of uh, of all of this. You know, I mean, so and and we're going to see that this Freedom Caucus, in many ways, is both sort of more sort of you know traditional in the last decades GOP American in a certain way in terms of our own oligarchs and our own economic uh, vampires of some sort, right, Uh, trying to basically loot and pillage the uh, American system to some large extent. Um, But it's also uh, very wide into the Middle East, and and, uh, we'll deal a little bit with, like, the presence of, of... of Daily Wire and uh, Ben Shapiro alongside Jordan Peterson, alongside someone like Ron Dermer, a key figure in Jerusalem uh, in a recent uh, talk that they that they gave there and what it all means in terms of what's being uh, covered up here. And so that's one of the reasons why it may seem like I sort of like fixate a little bit on this Russian component is because there's so much more there than almost anyone I think realizes, including us. Uh, and uh, and and we need to deal with the counterintelligence aspects of this if we even want to be able to have a chance of understanding what the information uh, landscape is, let alone unpack the transnational and international uh, uh, pieces of it. So it's sort of, in a certain way, it's in it's a response to, at some level of the denial of of uh, the Trump Russia investigation, the eleven nine operation as as just a, a bigger uh, an umbrella uh, part of that, and uh, and so I just wanted to say that. And it's a denial on top of in many many elements of what we call the alternative media, the truth movement, whatever term you want to use. Not only is there a denial, but there's a full on support for in borderline in some cases dare i say a borderline almost like worshiping hero worship of russia the nation and of uh the idea that russia is fighting a noble is the good guys on the global scale fighting the war to the com- the common the um combination of the the good guys in the global culture war and then also the good guys in the um the global war on terror which go hand in hand in terms of rolling back the the america the the corrupt um, American uh, Western uh, Zionist global empire and all of their uh, all their activities and and so it's and that that's a just a cherry on top of that is not only the denial but in a lot of cases from people who we argue should know better who um, who we thought maybe thought more of a number of years ago and their in their ability to think uh, reasonably and critically about matters than we do now actively are are um, see Russia as the heroic entity in this one reality, it does appear to us that um, that not only is this as bad as the the, the, the nace, the never the anti-Trump people say or the but it's but it's worse than like the way in the media in so many cases has covered up the depths of the uh, of what's going on. Also, while uh, we've talked about before, just uh, making Russia, in some cases, it'll be making Russia out to be this cartoonish Cold War villain, or, um, and also we've talked about the complicity of our own Congress and not getting to the bottom of uh, the the depths of Trump Russia or the global uh, global 11-9 operation in large part, maybe because of a nation like Israel, but then also the fact that there is this long-term um, long-term uh, infiltration and in, into our, the highest levels of our intelligence agencies, as you continue to talk about with the uh, constantly continuing to hammer home the importance of uh, of the Angleton operation and, and other operations that have gone on since then. And that then also is, then you bring in the, um, the aligning of the American conservative movement through the, uh, through the Council for National Policy and its satellite groups um, to align with Russia in terms of the uh, of this, um, and you sent me this really interesting quote from William F. Buckley about the I'll, I'll uh, save my Buckley um, uh, voice for now, but of how the, um, the the two most two most I forget the exact term, but the two most um, telling facts of the 
two halves of the 20th century or that um, the first half was that Americans speak English and the second half is that Russians are white. And like, that was a very interesting little quote you found. And we'll, we'll provide a link to that. Uh, so I said, I'm not going to break my Buckley impression out right now. Maybe <laughs> another time. Okay. Um, but yeah, but that quote, and that's what we've seen over the last, uh, and take for what you will, what to make out of that quote. But um, the point is that we've seen over the last, certainly since the end of the Cold War, the the aligning of the American of elements of the American evangelical movement and the uh, the paleocons as they would be called, or as we call them now, the neo neocons, uh, the the fusioning together of the uh, culture wars and the war on terror and the um, America and Russia joining together as the um, the allies to um, fight the Christian the war for Christian. Uh, some people might call it Judeo Christian. Other people would just say Christian um, Western civilization against the um, against the degenerates and all of this. And so there's there's an active denial in so many areas of, uh, not just denial, but this false impression would be an understatement uh, that this, not only there's no, nothing going on with uh, Russia and our elections or for an international scale, but also that this entity is actually our ally and that Amer good, good patriotic Americans should align themselves with Russian interests. And a lot comes up in that, and one thing that comes up in my mind is just the recent um, the passing of the uh, Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. And I've been re reinvestigating uh, the especially his assassination and the networks there. And we've talked many times about the William Pepper investigation into it, which actually came to a uh, you know to a a crescendo in an actual civil suit that proved a conspiracy to uh, to kill King that included high level elements uh, inside of the U.S. national security uh, establishment, including elements within the FBI, uh, the local Memphis uh, police, but also in terms of uh, CIA uh, and then uh, army, certain army intelligence units. And there are, again, I keep coming back then to Angleton. There's, you know, people who have focused on the John Kennedy assassination have come to a point, basically all roads lead to Angleton in terms of the Kennedy assassination. And, and in the, you know, in the way that I like to conceptually frame these deep events where you're dealing with military in, in an assassination, you're talking about the military function is shooters, right? How does the person actually, the target of the assassination, actually die, right? Then intelligence, you're then dealing with the question of framing or the patsy. In that case, you're talking about Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, but then you're talking about counterintelligence, which then is about how do you um, muddy the waters? How do you protect the operator? You're talking about op also operational security to some extent, I think, when you're thinking about uh, counterintelligence ag against the world knowing in many ways that includes domestically uh, in the United States. And so all roads, you know, wh wherever sort of people come from in terms of the who and the why of the, the President John Kennedy assassination, they almost all end up at Angleton's desk. Because Angleton was overseeing the Oswald file, it looked, uh, to, to some extent. But remember, Angleton's also overseeing the Israel file. And so the even the Michael Collins Piper thesis of the very strong uh, Israeli state component, then the deep state component, meaning the Meyer Lansky uh, organized crime syndicate operating uh, in the United States and and then transnationally, key key uh, runners of of weaponry and mil military material to the fledgling state of uh, Israel, and then of course this sort of uh, at the epicenter of the question of the nuclear program, as as what uh, Piper and then now others have like you know honed in on as a very likely key driver of motive. Uh, that also helps describe describe uh, you know means and opportunity uh, surrounding the the Israeli and the more Zionist network uh, uh, forces surrounding the assassination of Kennedy, which then then will then and this is why I bring up Angleton, then comes back to Angleton, and so you gotta understand too. I think that that as I pointed out before that. 
Seymour Hirsch exposes that Angleton, and now there's a you know a whole book about MH Chaos, which was the the one of these programs that Angleton was running of you know obviously illegal the CIA's charter you can't do, operate domestically now everybody knows that that sort of you know uh, you know uh, a nice fairy tale to some extent but it's still there's bureaucratic bureaucratic uh, uh, you know challenges to the CIA operating in that way and it does look like Colby looked at this and was like what the heck is, you know what the heck is Angleton really got us into uh, to some extent, especially since it has apparently not produced anything in terms of Angleton and the mail, uh, opening up people's mail. Think about that as like early NSA prism kind of, uh, you know, uh, mass surveillance uh, uh, move. And so it goes beyond that because if you think of like FBI COINTELPRO, key, key target of FBI COINTELPRO was King himself, uh, but also the networks surrounding uh, King but then you got to throw in what was the CIA's domestic, uh, you know, uh, chaos warfare, in that case, literally MH chaos, right? Uh, but also uh, political warfare and very likely, you know, actual hot uh, operations domestically. It looks like it's got to come back to Angleton, too. So then if you're talking about not only Kennedy or Kennedys, and remember then then Robert Kennedy is then assassinated in the months after Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated, and there's a whole component there that the sort of intersection of the Israeli uh, component uh, and the American deep state component is most on display with Robert Kennedy in certain ways, because you have the Palestinian terrorist, right, as the Zionists still to this day uh, talk about. They say that's the cover-up of the Robert Kennedy assassination is that Sirhan Sirhan was the first Palestinian terrorist in the Western world in a big way, right? And and so there's a whole component uh, there. And overseeing all of this counterintelligence, and I would say at the center, the desk actually being able to manage the entirety of you got to deal with the military component, the shooters and all of that. And uh, and then you got to deal with the cover up, and then you got to deal with the the uh, patsy or the frame job part of it in terms of intelligence networks and cultivating that so that that looks credible to some extent. It's you're back to Angleton, so you got to then think about Angleton in terms of the assassination of King. I think, and what's interesting is that you begin to then sort of like see the same network, the same deep state network that you really begin to see if you take seriously the Israeli hypothesis in relationship to John Kennedy operating via the Meyer Lansky crew, who is uh, Jack Ruby, the guy who helps cover up, right, the uh, the Patsy, he liquidates the Patsy concern by uh, shooting Oswald, and that's actually Jacob Rubenstein, right? That's Meyer Lansky's uh, West Coast Mickey Cohen lieutenant, Right, but it, Jack Ruby is also deeply involved in the uh, Texas scene in Dallas, and he seems to be on the, he seems to be involved with the Bronfmans, and then you then there's a whole network then that ties up into the Bronfmans home, you know, hometown where you're talking about Canada, and Montreal and Toronto, and there's a whole connection there to the that sits at the heart of the Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, assassination plot where you where everybody you know pepper eventually gets there in terms of this guy raul who uh the the you know the framed patsy of the martin luther uh king uh jr uh, operation it, it flees there and is uh is, is also appears to have been set up uh there and sort of brought into the uh to the fold to be framed uh, to be framed up for the King assassination, and this is that same clique operating there, uh, the deep state component of it. And so then you got to remember then there's this also the Angleton and Hoover, right? Because you're still dealing with the FBI, the the closeness with the Meyer Lansky crew uh, in all of this. And so then one last piece of this that I've been beginning to really think through again is then the question of Angleton. And uh, just sort of went back to the question we've we you know we've looked into this a little bit like it came onto our radar a little bit of that King and this is from the Matrokin archives right this is one of the um, uh, what are the key data dumps of Soviet intelligence uh, um, 
in the in uh, the recent decades. It basically says that, and maybe I'll just read this. It basically just says that um, King was the only. They say the only. Now I'll disagree with this, but let's. All right, I'm just going to read this here from 236 of the Sword and the Shield, the Matrokin Archive and the Secret History of the KGB. All right, quote, The most celebrated victim of the FBI's own active measures was the great civil rights leader Martin Luther King. Hoover's obsessive belief that King was, quote, a tomcat with de degenerate sexual urges, unquote, and his simmering resentment at King's criticism of the FBI led him to make the preposterous allegation to a group of journalists in 1964 that, quote, King is the most notorious liar in the country, unquote. When his staff urged him to insist that his outburst was off the record, Hoover refused, quote, unquote, feel free, he told the journalist, to, quote, print my remarks as given, unquote. The act of measures against King were organized apparently without Hoover's knowledge by FBI Assistant Director William C. Sullivan. In December 1964, Sullivan sent King a tape recording of some of his adulterous sexual liaisons, which the Bureau had obtained by bugging his room in Washington's Willard Hotel. With the tape was an anonymous letter which purported to come from a disillusioned former supporter. Quote, King, look into your heart. You know you are a complete fraud and a great liability to all of us Negroes. You could have been our greatest leader. You, even at an early age, have turned out to be a dissolute, abnormal, moral imbecile. You are finished. You will find on the record for all time your hideous abnormalities. What incredible evilness. It is all there on the record." Unquote. King was probably the only prominent American to be the target of active measures by both the FBI and the KGB. By the mid, oh, go for oh, it. Oh, I was just going to say this. This reminds me a little bit um, uh, of the oh, that this just happens. This perfectly written just happens to get into the what right into Hoover's office directly to J. Edgar Hoover from this uh, disgruntled former King supporter. Um, almost reminds me of a. Um, coked out Hunter Biden dropping off his laptop with the technician and it ends up in Rudy Giuliani's hands very conveniently. And th this is delivered. Yeah. This is delivered to King though. Yeah. Th th this was, they did, this was, the, this was where they delivered the tape that they had uh, recorded of, of King and then uh, taped a taped this note to, uh, to it. So the FBI did, did this exact basically as uh, you know, as, basically violent disinformation and they said that they they were attempting to get him to commit suicide right yeah and so all right i'm going to finish uh this uh piece here my mistake on that no that's okay quote uh bottom of page 236 the sword of the shield uh of the matrokin archive now, this is written by christopher andrew and vasily matrokin Quote, King was probably the only prominent American to be the target of active measures by both the FBI and the KGB. By the mid-1960s, the claims by the Communist Party USA leadership that secret party members within King's entourage would be able to, quote-unquote, guide his policies had proven to be hollow. Unquote. I just want to point out that this is where I disagree. There's a, a few different pieces of that are missing here, obviously. I actually don't think King was probably the only pro prominent American to be the target of active measures by both the FBI and the KGB. I, to me, it looks like that's, you're dealing with also John Kennedy, you know, and then this goes then to begin to uh, illustrate what we're dealing with and what we're actually talking about when we're talking about deep politics, because we're not actually talking about the totality of government systems. Uh, which is what you'll see actually a lot. That's you'll see the consensus between like the Steve Bannons on Tim Pool sitting, ne you know, right there next to the Luke Radowskis on Tim Pool, and that what they agree upon is as uh, Steve Bannon here, uh, Tim Pool points out that Steve Bannon is just like pointing, you know, very, uh, you know, positively and nodding his head every time Luke uh, Radowski says something especially uh, sort of against the 
deep state or even against government per se. And then Bannon says, this is my anarchist pointing at Lucre. This is my, this is my anarchist. And now, now you've got stupid Luke Rudowski with a Joe and the Ho must go t-shirt with uh, Matt Gates, who's been accused in his own right of um, inappropriate activities with minors. And then um, while he's on stage with Bannon and Charlie Kirk at Turning Point USA um, conference. And meanwhile, this is the guy who's all about the Epstein operation, all about compromise. And it's pretty sad. But, uh, <laughs> but also the other thing about this is that um, going back to in any event, um, going back to this whole angle, this is not something you hear about. Like there's no play. There's very like no no significant play of any type of um within any type of major any type of platform that i can find with any type of significant audience of uh of this element you're talking about here whether it's the elements that believe like the u.s martin luther king was a heroic figure who was assassinated killed by elements of american intelligence and whatnot all the way to the people who say martin luther king was the epitome of the communist conspiracy and uh they'll justify the surveillance on him while also making him out to be one of the worst human beings in history there's no talk of this uh of this element here so regardless of what's missing or what's lacking or what may or may what may not be true elements of uh things that are missing or left out or omitted it or even um, dis or misinformation within this archive here. The fact is like it doesn't get any play and there's no, um, I can't think of any any areas where there's a discussion about this going on in a serious um, in a serious manner. And perhaps there are some things we're missing, but I haven't seen this conversation taking place pretty much anywhere I can think of. No, and there's, you know, there's article write-ups about this uh, in different places, and but it's never really discussed and analyzed per se. And the key, what I would say, the key piece missing here, uh, and this is key in terms of actually if we're to really sort of delve into the deep truth uh, of, this, uh, of this fact that I believe is true, that, uh, that uh, King had become a target of both the FBI and the KGB at the same time, is that one thing, of course, is that he's not the only one, right? Because there is a deep state in the United States that is institutionally based, but it's not the purvey. It's not the entire government. It's not the, the average worker. It's not even the average CIA analyst or the average FBI uh, agent. You know, it's definitely not the post office. Uh, and and so then this then points to the question of like actual of the reason that like it's very important that people like Chomsky are really denialists of the entirety of 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 why actually analyzing deep politics is important. And the question of conspiracy uh, and uh, as a mode of, of massively transformative, almost always negative uh, political action that has massive domestic and geopolitical consequences, you know? And so, you know, that's one piece that's missing here, that this is what goes way beyond just a sort of one target of both of these sets that are apparently on opposing sides of the Cold War or something uh, like that, because as we pointed out before, there's indications that this that the conversation that was beginning to happen between Kennedy and Khrushchev was actually desired to be ended by uh, sets on quote unquote both sides inside the the Soviet Union and in, inside the United States. And remember this compartmentalization uh, aspect, the secrecy part that is uh, core. Secrecy and deception are the core, really, of like uh, of uh, secure of like the deep state in terms of the national quote unquote security part of it, of intelligence operations, clandestine operations. That's what you're dealing with, compartmentalized. So it's very possible, as we know from it, like most educated people in the United States know that elements, at the very least, of the national security state in the United States have massive power compared to the elected, uh, you know, president or, uh, you know, Congress people of the moment. They are seen as not really needing to know uh, some of these massive things. And then even inside of the CIA, that was a key piece of understanding Angleton's legacy, is that he basically might have been like the lone person who had access to very specific files he had tons of like uh, uh of like uh of safes set up around amongst different floors of the of the CIA 
And they and then Colby found them after he pushed them out, and they had to like drill or someone found it, but they had to drill them open, uh, and all of this. And that's also a symbol in many ways of the of the operational control of someone like an Angleton in relationship to these deep events. So those are the the, the two main problems here, I would say, inclu- that include the, I would say this is a very likely a very true fact that's very important, that it wasn't only the uh, domestic elements that had targeted uh, King uh, for moving out, but there was also this uh, KGB element that was targeting him uh, for uh, moving him out of the way, is that they don't say the CIA they don't say the CIA here. And this is crucial because I think that Angleton, again, would be an among, and amongst others. And this is Pepper has uncovered a lot of this, actually, in terms of the, the network of CIA that was very, uh, you know, uh, very likely involved at the core of actually helping set up the uh, King assassination. But then Angleton himself, if in a repetition of what he had very likely been at the middle of just five years earlier with the assassination of an American president, the setting it up, the covering it up, the framing of it, and all of that, that this probably happened again. And then if you then, then you know, sort of factor in the questions of Angleton, who is he serving multiple interests at the same time, very likely. And so I just want us to read these facts in relationship to the possibility of, uh, of uh, you know, the, don't forget the CIA and don't forget this much longer term, more structuralized deep state in the United States that, in, that, that includes uh, the CIA and people like Angleton when you think about the fact that the KGB uh, also targeted uh, King. And one more thing is that even like, um, you know, even the CIA as we know it, like when people will say like the CIA's history of doing this, this, and this. Yeah, that's a very real history there. But then also when you take into consideration these angles and element that like there's much more at play than just like, quote, the CIA end of story. There's there's a much more to that. There's much more of that history and getting into like the um, ins and outs and the uh, a deep dive into a person like Angleton will reveal that it's much, much more than just the CIA or business as usual, American um, imperial uh, uh, politics or imperial policy and whatnot. So it's way, way more than that. I mean, that's an understatement to say the least, but yeah, it does shed light that it's much, much more than just that going on. There's a lot of people that have a vested interest in reinforcing that it's simply just that American um, politics of uh, imperial domination of the world and uh, domestic control over the population, business as usual. So that's it's much, much more than that. That's a great point. And that also part of that is also making it monolithic, even when you're talking about the whether whatever sort of state we're talking about, whether we're talking about the United States or or Russia in, in this case, the you know, there this plays into the hands of the people who hijacked this discourse and used the deep state to basically either refer to just sort of one side of the aisle and the Obamas and the lackeys of uh, the George Soroses and all that, that's one thing, or it's the totality of the quote-unquote bureaucratic state as uh, Bannon and apparently his uh, favorite uh, anarchist, uh, anarcho-libertarian, narco-capitalist lackey, Luke Radowski. The apparently. administrative state, yeah. The administrative the state. Of the administrative state, yes. Right, and so then there's this mono, monolith. it's a sort of the return of the monolithic conspiracy, but in this case it's the, the state as such in, in some ways, or or the administrative state, as Bannon might sort of try to parse it a little bit. But as we'll see, like the, you know, the, this is what keeps coming back, and this will eventually be the actual policy goal of how you'll see the fusing of the, you know, the sort of rhinos or the MAGA and name only, you know, the MIGAs or something like that, uh, MINAs, <laughs> I don't know, uh, and and then the freedom, the quote unquote freedom caucus uh, in terms of, you know, and we'll analyze some of the dynamics that show this in terms of Marjorie Taylor Greene and this apparent sort of pincher move that they're running alongside the Matt Gates, the inside outside game and the, you know, the Freedom Caucus versus McCarthy game, you're going to see begin to see that the actual result, the policy result of that, uh, two things. What This is the prediction. One thing is they're basically saying it. They're saying that they're going to do 
sounds like Benghazi uh, investigations uh, 2.0, basically on uh, steroids and like Sam scam bankman fraud uh, amphetamines of some sort. And that's basically Hunter Biden's laptop and then the Twitter files and uh, maybe then in some investigation into uh, Russiagate, the uh, deep state conspiracy theory or something Don't like forget that. Forget the investigations into all the uh, the out of control wokeness. Right. Oh, maybe they will do some CRT in the military as the greatest threat uh, uh, hearings. You're probably right. They'll probably dangle some of that uh, for the uh, Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, was, culture um, war crowd. Yeah. I thought of that because of um, I, um, the Lauren Boebert clip of her saying that they're going to investigate the Blue Anon that want to punish families for caring about their children. That's a good point. And G- Gates basically was asked, you know, point blank, like by the Tim Pool and people, basically, what are what are the results of this your Freedom Caucus move uh, going to actually be? And Gates is like, well, if you're hoping that we're gonna like march, you know, uh, you know, uh, frog march, uh, Hunter Biden out in handcuffs, it's probably not gonna happen, and we're probably not gonna even get into the question of the Biden institution at Penn, at, uh, Penn State and the questions of, uh, uh, is it Penn State or is it UPenn? Uh, right? University, University of Pennsylvania, yeah. University of Pennsylvania and, and uh, Chinese money influence there and all that. And Gates is basically, uh, you know, man- managing expectations, lowering expectations of before the MAGA set in terms of what the actual result of it is going to be. But that's going to be one side of it. And then the other part of it, the twin pillar of it, is going to be what's being sort of hinted at. The question of social security is back on the table. Uh, they seem to even have it out for the Jack Smith, the uh, special uh, counsel prosecutor of the Trump document thing. Now we have another one for the Biden document uh, scenario, but the MAGA people have it out for Jack Smith. Uh, and they seem to even be pointing at his, at his wife uh, as some kind of... Uh, or Trump even said it right on on True Social, something about how she is just a full blown hater, Marxist, communist, woke, you know, uh, militant of some sort. It's mainly, a slight bit of an exaggeration, I think. There, and but mainly, it looks like to me that the main, probably the actual, the reason, the motivation behind the actual networks, like the actual oligarchical networks, some of which is symbolized by. The, uh, for example, the oligarchical backers of uh, Ben Shapiro originally for the Daily Wire or even Dennis Prager, the Prager U. You're talking about, you know, oil and uh, fracking uh, oligarch billionaires uh, under the guise of uh, Yahwehist uh, Christian uh, Zionist uh, types or Christian in the Jewish uh, form uh, types, uh, the the brothers, right? I forget what their name is. The uh, uh, Wilkes brothers. The Dan and Ferris Wilkes brothers, right? Or or you're dealing with like the background of the actual CMP types, uh, or the Koch brothers, or that that kind of those kinds of interests. The Jack Smith's wife is a documentarian. She seems to be just sort of like a, you know, a liberal, a sort of classic liberal sort of progress, maybe a little bit progressive uh, type documentarian, and she made a movie about uh money uh dark money and that seems to be like really like the issue that uh that they have uh with with her i think i think that's sort of behind it she made a movie in 2018 called dark money uh directed by kimberly reed uh produced by katie shavigny that's uh jack smith's a uh, wife and it goes into the question of uh the Federal Election Commission and the question of Citizens United. Remember how core that is to the question of dark money, the antecedents of uh, the press of the precedents, basically that set up the eleven nine operation and way beyond in terms of funneling uh, dark money uh, into the American political uh, system. Remember the lead uh, Supreme Court uh, justice uh, being Anthony Kennedy on the uh, decision of Citizens United, and then the obvious compromat background uh, in relationship to uh, Trump swapping out uh, Kennedy as his uh, first uh, justice to replace, and then the question of Justice Kennedy's uh, familial background with his father as an apparent mobbed up uh, lawyer in the California political scene, and then his son, Justin Kennedy, 
just happened to sit at the key place in Deutsche Bank where it was like the lone uh, American operating bank standing to actually continue to finance uh, uh, Donald Trump and uh, lend to him. Uh, and then obviously Deutsche Bank is this key syndicate for the Epstein money, for the Russian laundromat, dozens of billions of dollars laundered through there, and then much more, including the background of the financing of uh, Auschwitz, I think, is a, that's a Deutsche Bank a scenario there too. So this is partially what we mean by when we talk about deep politics. We're also talking about context for understanding real basic bitch kind of policy things that we're going to begin seeing here under the guise of MAGA and like these deep state routers and all of that. You're really going to see just sort of like old school, let's get rid of like the uh, regulatory bureaucracy so that the uh, Koch brothers and all the oligarchs who finance the, uh, the CNP and the Wilkes brothers and all those types uh, all throughout the country will uh, will benefit. And then maybe they can even then loot and loot the and loot and pillage the social security funds as they've been wanting to for years and years and years and years. So those are the sort of two pillars to look for in terms of the real politic policy is just going to be an attack on the administrative state, so-called uh, as a way to uh, further loot and pillage uh, and open it up for maybe not even our only our domestic oligarchs, but also for uh, international oligarchs to come in and get a piece of the uh, vampiric pie too. And then that the sauce of that, then the sort of the, or the, uh, the lubrication for that, the cultural war lubrication for all of that will be then the commissions and the the uh, anti-CRT commissions and the Hunter Biden's laptop and the twi- the woke tw- the woke Silicon Valley uh, investigations and uh, and every sort of sort of Biden uh, thing that they're going to sort of signal towards impeachment but never do it sort of like Nancy Pelosi tried to do. Yeah, and there's a I believe there's currently a push in Florida to ban African American history studies. It's it's anti American and it's too pro CRT. And this is together with uh, Mike Huckabee's daughter, the new uh, governor of uh, Arkansas, the former Trump press secretary, um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, banning quote unquote CRT from all curriculum in Arkansas. So that's definitely being uh, being escalated in the moment here. And uh, um, I could say I took African American history classes in uh, high school back in the mid 2000s, and they were anything but. Um, I wasn't learning to hate my country because I took an African American history class. I I can't imagine things have changed that much more in 15 years. But I digress. But um, there's definitely a weaponized escalation in in that regard. I think that will be part of the Benghazi on steroids of the congressional committees that are going to be overseen by the likes of uh of jim jordan and his ilk and uh, and so this gates thing um there were a couple moments greg, where you- greg, oh sorry greg i just want to finish up uh the, i want to finish the matrokin archive stuff if if we can no let's go for it okay and i, I just wanted to, to uh like finish up this point too um that you know if as you point out like the this key thing that uh that DeSantis said in when he re you know Rewon the uh, governorship in Florida, uh, where, you know, Florida is where woke comes to die, right? So if Florida, DeSantis is Florida is where woke comes to die, then the new Freedom Caucus influenced U.S. Congress is going to be where woke is, uh, comes to be waterboarded or tortured on live television or something, or something like that. And that's a good, I'd, good one. That's a good, that's a good way to look at it. It's a good take. And, and the other thing I, that came to my mind when you were making the really important point about how there is this attempt to sort of make this all about, you know, either the sort of one evil country, the evil Yankee empire, or as then I pointed out, the or the sort of totalization, the rehashing of the monolithic conspiracy theory under the guise of the, uh, the, the sort of weaponized, uh, undermined actual translation of the deep state by the Bannonites. And then how the sort of anarcho-capitalist libertarian types feed into all of that ultimately is symbolized by uh, the Sith Lord Bannon saying, calling Luke Radowski, who remember sort of started the We Are Change uh, organization as uh, in line with the Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, Gandhian principles of nonviolence towards uh, co- holding to account for truth, justice, peace and freedom of the September 11th attacks. 
which is actually banned, it looks like, in a serious way on the Tim Pool show. And Luke knows it. Tim's basically said it sort of openly at some point and will usually discourage it. Ian Crossland uh, seems to sort of break through that. He even brought up the NIST study into the, the World Trade Center uh, 9-11 uh, investigation uh, up with Gates. And uh, Gates tried to actually cut him off. I'm sorry, yeah. Greg. I go, went back to Gates. Uh, That's okay. Um, but that Gates tried to cut him off and then bring it right into that's the Saudi playbook uh, in certain ways, right? But this is sort of the, you know, what is uh, coming, I think, in terms of the attempt to then re, uh, you know, restate the the MAGA years of the government is the problem uh, under the guise of the deep state as as such. And what popped in my mind when you first said that, Greg, was what we notice about this uh, recently published uh, biography, a memoir by Senator Patrick Leahy, The Road Taken, where he talks about, in you know, th- this is an example of, this is not a monolithic state, nor is the CIA, quote-unquote, a monolithic organization that was just bloodthirsty and trying to go to war with Iraq. All of the analysts at all of the deaths, all of the operators at the CIA just wanted to go... Uh, you drink some Iraqi blood or something like that, or service uh, Cheney's Halliburton or the uh, Israeli Likud uh, clean break war, uh, you know, strategy. No, there was the, Patrick Leahy, Senator Patrick Leahy, by the way, one of the targets of part of the 9 11 false flag operation, which was the Amerithrax operation. His office was a target of that, the one that, you remember, the, 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 the notes. Uh, death to it. We have this anthrax, you, you know, uh, this is next, America, death to America, death to Israel, Allah is great, scribbled like a sort of like a seventh, uh, seven-year-old with like a crayon kind of scenario with a very highly weaponized military-grade uh, anthrax. So that lady then talks about how during um, the run-up to the decision on the uh, Iraq war, that he had what he believed to be two, uh, see, he doesn't really ever say, he says he never asked them, but he seems to be directly implying that he knew that they were uh, two CIA officers of some sort who jogged up to him and his wife while they were running and directed him specifically to key pieces of the information that was backing the intelligence community's assessment of the question of Iraq. Uh, in relationship to weapons of mass destruction and the reason for war and all of that, and directed him to a place that he had not looked yet. And he said, have they shown, they said to Leahy, have they shown you this? Uh, should I read this, Greg? Because I'm we've sort of talked about this before. It's real brief. Yeah, we can read that. But I was just going to say real quick before you do that, um, I wonder if these are the partisan the partisan intelligence agency operatives that, uh, according to both Rush Limbaugh, the now deceased Rush Limbaugh, and former um, veteran of the uh, Faiz Wormser uh, Office of Special Plans gang in the Bush Cheney administration, uh, and now Russian state media favorite uh, Michael Maloof, both stated tricked Bush into going to war. So I wonder um, if these uh, if these gentlemen who um, gave uh, Patrick Leahy this information on a jog would fit into those partisan intelligence. <laughs> and who was who was uh, next to Maloof? Uh, Giraldi. Oh my God. Yeah, well, Giraldi. Yes, yes. We'll uh, we'll we'll yeah. I'll find that clip and post it again so that people can can. Um, re-familiarize themselves with that clip if they never saw it before. So I'll, I'll put that in our show notes. All right. So you have uh, The Road Taken, a memoir by Senator Patrick Leahy, uh, page 298. And he talks about thumbing his way through the material, which was similar to the public record. What jumped out was the conclusion that Saddam Hussein coveted weapons of mass, ma- mass destruction, but the reality was that little had really changed over the years. Um... I'm going to skip down here. Quote, many in the administration seem to draw tenuous connections between Hussein and Al-Qaeda. Specifically, those are the, the basically the 9-11 facilitators, at the very least, those that took advantage of 9-11, and some of them tied in, I would say, to the 9-11 perpetrators. Those were the ones who were really pushing the Saddam Hussein-Al-Qaeda connection. All right, back to the text. Quote, but I remember just how much he, a largely secular autocrat, had long been the target, not the patron of al-Qaeda zealots, 
who dreamed of restoring a religious caliphate and kicking out the existing order. I read the details. The cl conclusion was thin. If an al-Qaeda terrorist had found sa safe passage through Iraq en route to Iran, it was hardly a sign of Saddam's cooperation with al-Qaeda and more likely proof of Iraq's porous border or the old saying, quote, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, unquote. If a terrorist thug was on his way to create chaos in Iran, the regime would happily turn a blind eye to his safe passage. My conclusion was caution. I simply didn't see proof of an imminent threat or a new rush by a madman to obtain weapons of mass destruction. I saw the status quo as it had been for, for a long time. Quote, looks like the Middle East, unquote, I said to the intelligence officer sitting at the desk. The following Sunday, Marcel and I went for our usual, usual uh, early morning walk in the neighborhood. Oh, walk. It was a warm September day, and we walked hand in hand. Two fit joggers trailed behind us. They stopped and asked what I thought of the intelligence briefings I'd been getting. Marcel realized this was a conversation that normally she would not be involved in and kept on walking ahead. I went through a requisite disclaimer that if I was in briefings and if they were classified, I could not acknowledge that they even occurred and could not talk about them if they had. They told me they understood that, but asked whether the briefers had showed me file 8. It was obvious from the look on my face that I had not seen such a file. They suggested I should and that I might find it interesting. Quickly thereafter, I arranged to see file 8 and it contradicted much of what I had heard from the Bush administration. Days later, Marcel and I were out walking again when the two joggers reappeared. After the opening greetings, they told me they understood I had seen File 8 and asked what did I think about it. It was the eeriest conversation I had experienced in Washington. I felt like a senatorial version of Bob Woodward meeting Deep Throat only in broad daylight. I went through the usual disclaimers that I could not talk about any file and if such a file was available and so on. They said, of course, they understood, but they wondered if I had also been shown file 12 using a code word. Again, I think the look on my face gave them the answer. They apologized for interrupting our walk and jogged off. The next day, I was back in the secure room in the Capitol to read file 12, and it again contradicted the statements that the administration and especially Vice President Cheney, seemed to be re relying on. And I told my staff and others that for a number of reasons I absolutely intended to vote against the war in Iraq. I've been around too long to do differently. It is hard to think of any vote that is taken by the Senate that is more important than voting to go to war or not. While we never had a declaration of war in Vietnam, the falsehoods and misleading information regarding the Gulf of Tonkin episode brought about a vote in the Senate that guaranteed the continuation of the war. Only one senator voted no. Had the Senate asked more questions, had it drilled down into the facts, who knows how history could have been different. Instead, that war went on for years, and thousands of deaths, uh, and thousands of deaths later, until it was officially ended by a one-vote margin in the Armed Services Committee of the U.S. Senate in 1975. And he goes on uh, 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 about uh, other stuff there. Um, but I, I think that's important to understand, like, especially this proves the lie to the Maloof, uh, you know, for Russian state media uh, crapola uh, of, no, it wasn't my boss, you know, it wasn't the, D the Doug Feist and the Office of Special Plans and the Neocon Network that connected a, I would say, a, treasonous element of the United States government with a treasonous element of the Israeli government, very high up in both. Um, it wasn't them. It was the, uh, the Democrats and the liberal media trying to frame Trump, trying to frame Bush or something like that. It was the CIA and the Democrat liberals and uh, trying to frame a Bush. So this, that only, not only proves that lie, I'd say here, because this is pretty obvious that this is who uh, Leahy is talking to because they're, this is about the intelligence commi committee and intelligence files that are basically provided to the, se to the Senate by uh, CIA. So these are CIA people who are making sure that senators uh, are seeing what they need to see to actually get the full uh, scenario in terms of the Iraq uh, 
war vote. So obviously, this, these are not monoliths, uh, either as institutions or uh, individuals uh, in all of that. And I think it's just important to uh, consider that aspect uh, in relationship to what you pointed out, Greg. Thank you for that. And uh, last thing I'll throw in on this before I um, go back to the Matrokin uh, archive is um, one example of, I think going back to Kennedy, um, we might be in a position where we're going to see a heightened uh, state of um, another heightened effort of weaponized uh, narratives around the Kennedy assassination. I thought of this after seeing uh, Tucker Carlson the other night did a monologue where he uh, talked about the deep state coup, quote unquote, against Richard Nixon and how Nixon was targeted because he had told, um, you mentioned him earlier, uh, Richard Helms, then director of the CIA, that he knew who killed Kennedy in that, uh, and then linked it into the Biden, um, the the deep state plot against uh, against Trump and MAGA. And so I thought that was interesting, and it might be, and it might be, as we go on later this year in uh, November is going to be the 60th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination. So this could be another amplification of uh, weaponized uh, narratives around Kennedy. And 31 years after, likely it looks like definitely very interesting relationship to say the least with uh, Russian um, deep state elements. Oliver Stone um, popularized the uh, the popular culture around the Kennedy assassination with this film, JFK. Now you've got Tucker Carlson uh, throwing this out there in the midst of uh, the monolithic narratives about the, the deep state and the um, that pop up, whether it's on the quote unquote left or the quote unquote right with uh, the, um, the being the force either to destroy traditional patriotic conservative Americans or the force that's used to destroy dissent from the uh, from the downtrodden minorities in our population uh, the the reamplification of Kennedy under this monolithic uh, deep state umbrella that uh, both uh, forces from both the quote unquote right and left can um, will will push the idea of the monolithic uh, deep state with their own varying uh, um, narratives about what exactly the deep state is trying to accomplish and on what behalf. So I'd throw that in there. We might see a reamplification of uh, Kennedy in this uh, in this realm with uh, Tucker Carlson mentioning that Nixon was overthrown in a deep state coup in part because he had made noise about knowing who killed Kennedy. So That's a great point, Greg, because that that uh, the Tucker Carlson stuff on JFK and all that is like lighting up not only the MAGA sort of conspiracy sphere, but be way beyond that. Actually, people who I think should know better of who are like, oh, well, of course, Tucker Carlson, people who say, of course, Tucker Carlson is not our friend. But this is the, you know, this is like the biggest moment uh, of this kind of truth uh, on corporate television that we've seen maybe ever or something like that, who are being activated in, in a certain way there, right? And so this is why it's so important to understand the way that not only sort of, uh, you know, the uh, suppression of truth can be used uh, to obviously suppress the truth. But the proclamation of the sort of quote-unquote hidden truth, especially when spun in a certain way, when limited with a hangout, with lots of red herrings and non-disclosures involved, can also help uh, cover up the truth. This is one of the more difficult things or one of the later things that people who begin to do deep political analysis begin to understand is how many different ways one can do disinformation or propaganda or limit the hangout or counterintelligence uh, in all these ways. But that that uh, Tucker Carlson, JFK uh, blurb uh, really lit uh, people up. And of course, we still are battling to some extent for people who, you know, are really sort of, you know, getting to be pretty good researchers and analysts to really grapple with what it means about Oliver Stone and the fact that his the go-to movie about how the CIA and the Pentagon sort of uh, shadowy characters from the CIA and the Pentagon assassinated uh, President Kennedy was financed by Israeli military intelligence long-term Lacom of uh, originally Lacom agent uh, you know who was all that the uh, Arnon Milchan. But all you know, but that's also where Robert Maxwell comes up through is Lacom and the questions of nuclear, right? Especially in terms of JFK. And this is why you keep on seeing the cover up here of these layers, all the way from JFK to 9/11. There's these nuclear components and these Israeli components that really seem to be some of the most uh, tender aspects of this. But then you then once you throw in Angleton, then you gotta then start dealing with it's not just the Israeli aspect that is so sensitive here. There's some kind of other angle here too, 
and the questions of Angleton as potentially the high-level Soviet mole that he was looking for the whole time uh, begin to uh, come into this. And over and over, the sort of the the structural unpacking of deep politics becomes important because even going back to this question of Leahy and the timing of the Iraq war and then the background of the Amerithrax ta- attacks and 9-11 in relationship to the Patriot Act and then eventually, as this incident points out, the Iraq war, you got to be able to deal with timing. And I'm not sure exactly when this happened of what Leahy's talking about, but you, there's then the assassination apparent of Senator Paul Wellstone uh, who was also an opponent of the Iraq War? Uh, it looked like pretty pretty seriously, uh, and you're then dealing with more deep politics uh, in the midst uh, of of all of that. Um, and I've recently been like digging in, back digging into the question of like actually what Lacom actually looked like it was uh, shut down, and there's no there's no controversy. Arnon Milhand is long-term Israeli military intelligence agent working originally out of Lakam, which was about uh, supplying uh, scientific information and material for the to the highest levels, or sort of like the meta programming of the defense establishment uh, in Israel. And then after the Pollard affair. I believe they shut down LACOM and then re uh, reimplanted it in what's called the director as the director of security of the defense establishment in Israel or the Ministry of Defense Security Authority Mal Mob M A L M A B Mal Mob. So we and the, so that that also means the Negev Nuclear Research Center, but also the Israeli Institute for Biological Research. Uh, and uh, so that that was what became of LACOM, the Science Affairs Bureau. And now, so this, think about this as the actual producer of Oliver Stone's JFK film uh, that, uh, that Tucker Carlson is now sort of dipping his toe into that kind of, uh, you know, uh, realm of understanding of what was portrayed by the Director of Security of the Defense Establishment of Israel, Ministry of Defense Security Authority, Mall mob, right? Okay. And by the way, it, it looks like that this is also internally in terms of like actual Israeli politics and the question of Israel-Palestine, that it looks like a director of, uh, of mall mob was crucial in covering up uh, uh, the historical documents pointing to the actual severity and p- components of the original uh, Palestinian Nakba. And the violence and the ethnic cleansing and the terrorism and the mass murder that was involved in the creation of the uh, Israeli state that was, you know, proclaimed by these uh, Zionists as a, you know, a land without people for a people without a land. So this is very, very big. This points to major motive, I think, in terms of the the reason for the uh, articulation and the framing of the JFK film and thus the solidification of the actual understanding of who did it and why in a very specific and very deceptive way, I think, uh, that now people like Tucker Carlson have picked up on and the people sort of welcoming Oliver Stone with uh, open arms uh, as some kind of real serious dissident of the American system uh, and not someone apparently compromised in some much bigger fashion especially in the age of Trump Russia and Russian invasion of Ukraine and all of that background that we talked about his role in the documentaries around Ukraine uh, with some real shady characters. Uh, they, they're not serious intellectuals and all of that. Or even going back to the question of how Oliver Stone originally got on the case and the book the book he was delivered or the information he was delivered in what appears to be a very likely KGB-sponsored uh, delivery method in relationship to uh, you know covert action quarterly. Phil Ag, that's part that's part of the Matrokin archive too. Phil Ag was highly aware, the uh, former CIA uh, officer who then exposed the CIA. He was uh, fully aware that the KGB was helping uh, organize the uh, the wor- origins and workings of the covert action uh, quarterly. Uh, even if it also says the Matrokin archives also uh, says, uh, suggests that all of the other people were not aware of it involved, the other uh, individuals involved in that. Uh, and some of those were actually the ones who ultimately give Oliver Stone 
um, his, uh, you know, his real big push to become the guy who produces the film on the JFK uh, conspiracy. So then you got another Angleton question going on there. It's not maybe not just uh, the interests of uh, Israeli military te- intelligence and Ministry of Defense Security Authority, Malbob, uh, producing that film. Who else is potentially uh, directing uh, reasons for that. So there's there's a lot there to digest that this sort of question of Tucker Carlson talking about JFK and uh, Nixon and all of that really just begs the question, I, I would think. All right. Uh, without further ado, let's get back into the uh, Matrokin archive. All right. Thank you, Greg, for uh, keep, <laughs> keep getting me back off these tangents. Stay, uh, come for the info, stay for the tangents. That's our motto these days. It's, it's sort of like a, what's it called? A, a book, uh, David, uh, forget the guy who wrote these massive, uh, fiction books where the, some of the footnotes would be longer, like would take up most of the page. And sometimes I feel like they get caught up in that kind of scenario here, but thank you, Greg, for getting us back to the main, the main line, the main tangent here. All right. This is page 237. I'll just go right back there. 237 of The Sword and the Shield, The Matrokin Archive and the Secret History of the KGB by Christopher Andrew and Vasily Matrokin. Bottom of page 236. Quote, by the mid-1960s, the claims by the Communist Party USA leadership that secret party members within King's entourage would be able to, quote-unquote, guide his policies had proved to be hollow. To the center's dismay, King repeatedly linked the aims of the civil rights movement not to the alleged worldwide struggle against American imperialism, but to the fulfillment of the American dream, and, quote, the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, unquote. He wrote in his inspirational, quote, letter from Birmingham jail, unquote, in 1963, quote, I have no despair about the future. We will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham, Alabama, and all over the nation, because the goal of America is freedom. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands, unquote. Having given up hope of influencing King, the center aimed instead at replacing him with a more radical and malleable leader. In August 1967, the center approved an operational plan by the deputy head of Service A, Yuri Modin, or Yuri Modin, former controller of the Magnificent Five, Unquote. I believe, I'm not sure, I believe, I'm not sure the Magnificent Five, whether they're referring to the Cambridge Circle or not, but Modin was the apparent handler of the Cambridge uh, spy circle too. So Yuri Modin involved here. All right. Quote, Yuri Modin, former controller of the Magnificent Five to discredit King and his chief lieutenants by placing articles in the African press which could then be reprinted in American newspapers portraying King as a quote-unquote Uncle Tom, who was secretly receiving government subsidies to tame the civil rights movement and prevent it threatening the Johnson administration. While leading freedom marches under the admiring glare of worldwide television, King was allegedly in close touch with the president. The same operational plan also contained a series of active measures designed to discredit U.S. policy quote, on the Negro issue, issue, unquote. The center authorized Modine to, one, to organize through the use of KGB residency resources in the U.S. the publication and distribution of brochures, pamphlets, leaflets, and appeals denouncing the policy of the Johnson administration on the Negro question and exposing the brutal terrorist methods being used by the government to suppress the Negro rights movement. Two, to arrange via available agent resources for leading figures in the legal profession to make public statements discrediting the policy of the Johnson administration on the Negro question. Three, to forge and distribute through illegal channels a document showing that the John Birch Society, in conjunction with the Minuteman organization, is developing a plan for the physical elimination of leading figures in the Negro movement in the U.S., but and maybe we'll, we'll just leave it right there. And there's more, but that's into John Birch. The fact that they were like, you know, f- doing stuff with the to, to frame up the John Birch in a certain way brings me back to the whole the infamous John Birch flyer uh, preceding the uh, the uh, Kennedy assassination. Um, at the very least, it's interesting this modus operandi that's uh, 
uh, similar in a certain way. And then you get back to the question of Angleton as this key CIA operator and uh, his central role in the uh, Kennedy assassination. And I would then assert very likely central role in the King assassination uh, additionally. And then uh, this this interesting use of the John Birch Society to sort of like um, to f- sort of frame the situation in a very certain way uh, is is interesting. Yeah, um, uh, most most definitely, and uh, it's it's pretty interesting. Like you, uh, the just the usage of that's another thing you won't hear, by the way, from these uh, from these you know these Tucker Carlson types is how it was the um, the credible. Um, involvement of the uh almost like the uh the patriot um the patriot groups that uh led the that organized the um uh events and crowds on january 6 types that are uh that are now we're supposed to forget about because of uh, because of ray epps supposedly um the, their equivalents back in the 60s of like the jbs and the minutemen were so um involved in these uh in these events, that's something I don't think we'll hear from the from the Tuckers and their ilk. Uh, um, I would very be very surprised to ever hear them mention uh, JBS and calling Kennedy a traitor or their very um, vocal opposition to the um, burgeoning uh, civil rights movement and everything from uh, from fluoride in the water is going to make the racist mix to Martin Luther King is a um, is the is, is the number one destructive uh, communist agent in our country and the biggest liar in his the biggest liar in all of america is that uh letter you had um mentioned earlier i uh, said yeah exactly and greg there's one more paragraph on this other page that i think i'd mentioned to you um maybe i should just read it to sort of talk about wh- how how they were actually how the kgb was actually trying to influence a uh, uh, king yeah let's do it okay so that's page 290 um, quote, there was, however, some substance to the claim that the CPUSA, Communist Party USA, had penetrated King's entourage. The Childs brothers reported that one of King's advisors, Stanley D. Levison, a New York lawyer and entrepreneur, was a secret party member. Levison drafted sections of King's 1958 book, Stride Toward Freedom, and helped prepare his defense against trumped-up charges of perjury on his Alabama tax returns in 1960. Levison also introduced into King's entourage a secret black member of the CPUSA, Hunter Pitt's Jack O'Dell. The FBI, who put Levison under surveillance, reported that he was meeting Viktor Lesiovsky, a KGB officer working as special assistant to the UN Secretary General, Yu Thant. It was Levison's alleged influence on King, which in 1963 led Attorney General Robert Kennedy to authorize the bugging of King's hotel rooms. Though the bugs produce recordings of a number of King's uh, sexual liaisons in which President Lyndon B. Johnson took a prurient interest, they provided no evidence of communist influence on him. And then one last piece here that's interesting. At the beginning of the Carter administration in 1977, the Communist Party USA leadership made exaggerated claims of its influence over King's former executive secretary, Andrew Young, codenamed Luther, newly appointed as U.S. representative at the United Nations. According to Hall, quote, Young himself did not know that several of his close friends in Atlanta were co- covert communists, and he listened to them. The party, while observing the required clandestinity, clandestinity it's the first time I've heard that, clandestinity, would cautiously exert an influence on Young in the necessary areas. Lesiovsky's cover as assistant to Yu Thant gave him a number of opportunities for discussions with Young. Though he claimed to have obtained, quote, important information, unquote, from the discussions, he reported less up optimistically than Hall that while Young hoped for better U.S.-Soviet relations, his attitude to the Soviet Union was fundamentally, quote, unquote, negative. Uh, and then it goes actually into the in- interest and in influence in the Carter administration, uh, too, which is sort of interesting. And I just want to point out, you pointed this out too, Greg, when we were reading through this, that Andrew Young is this crucial figure in terms of being, being uh, you know, part of the Carter administration who was too close to the Palestinian question or too uh, a- a- Arabophilic, a- Arabophilic or something like that, right? And so then this thing goes back to the, get the question of ADL 
and the Meyer Lansky network uh, pieces that were part of the Kennedy assassination, apparently, and this question of Raul uh, and uh, Jack Ruby, uh, apparently uh, not only working for Meyer Lansky, but associated with the Bronfmans uh, in terms of the Kennedy assassination. But then also, why did the ADL uh, target King for, uh, for um, surveillance? And uh, in conjunction with the with Hoover's FBI, and why is that such a big secret? To where it's really there's only one place where it's been documented, and it's intensely covered up. I think it's a San Francisco Weekly article in the early '90s by a uh, by a a former ADL. He became a human rights uh, um, uh, guy, a Jewish guy, a ho- hoax child. I think it is. Uh, some I, I'll, I'll try to I'll try to find it. I keep on forgetting the uh, the details of all this. But he discloses in the San Francisco Weekly article that he was at the ADL from sixty two to sixty four, I think, are the years when he was there. And he said everybody knew that the ADL, the so called Anti Defamation League, was uh, spying on Martin Luther King Jr. Which then, when you then tie into some of this stuff of the question of the same networks uh, as the Kennedy assassination surrounding the King assassination, then the question of the turn of King's people towards what you might see as a more balanced approach to the Israel-Palestine or Jewish nationalism versus Palestinian nationalism question of the time uh, as very dangerous uh, to the ADL types and uh, uh, creating some motive uh, for them to be involved in uh, also wanting to get rid of uh, King. And this has obviously been hijacked by history, we pointed over and over again, of other statements that had been made by uh, King more on the record about his apparent support of Jewish nationalism uh, as some kind of like reapproach to uh, indigeneity project and self-determination. But it would make sense that, especially with King and who is surrounded by, that they would also then say, "All right, if uh, you know, if the if the Jews are allowed to return, quote unquote, to Palestine and to uh, you know, to the home, the Jewish, the uh, the home, the Jewish homelands uh, from from all around the world, then at the very least, the Palestinians who were there should also be able to return to their home." All right, so this is, I think, then you begin to sort of like factor in the the networks and then the motive, and you begin to get a more complete picture of what we were actually dealing with in terms of uh, who who killed uh, King and why, and uh, um, and it's not neat and tidy, and it's not singular, it's not monolithic, and you know? um, there's overlapping interests of some sort, and uh, and this is something to unlock, especially now where the the war has become very big and very informational and uh and there's really uh no one especially in the age of covid and and the so-called response to covid and all that we're now in in a world where we have to really understand the nature of information and truth and history and then figure out uh like people like really good journalists or prosecutors questions of motive and who, who, what, why, when, where, how, or means, motive, opportunity, or even going back to the uh, trivium of things like grammar, logic, rhetoric, that these kinds of conceptual structures that we then fit in to, uh, to we use to then fit the facts into, I think, are, are crucial to understand. We'll get a more accurate, not only a more accurate sense of actually truth in history, but really know what we are up against right now and then where we might want to go. Definitely. And we will most, most, uh, def- we will very much be returning to this topic in the, uh, in the future here on the antidote as this size, we continue to try to pin more and more pieces together of these, um, all still all vitally, vitally important of, uh, of, of I, I would say vital importance, still getting to the bottom of the 1960s and these prominent political and social figures who were were assassinated, who very well could have put our country and even uh, maybe the world in general on a somewhat different path than it ended up uh, going down over the uh, preceding decades and uh, that followed. So uh, yeah, we'll definitely be um, coming back to this on a rather frequent basis, I think, here at The Antidote as time goes on here.
especially we got 60 years coming up in uh, November of the Kennedy assassination. And as I mentioned, the aforementioned potential amplification of uh, weaponized um, narratives around it and and uh, linking that to weaponized narratives of the current moment. So. Um, I, I agree. And, and I also think that it really, you know, now more than ever, it's really important that we maybe do not miss an opportunity that maybe was missed before in terms of these very destructive and chaotic and torturous, tortious uh, interference with uh, human history uh, and national history, uh, and that, that we're in the midst of it. We're in the midst of it unfolding, and we are, on, we are players here, and we need to figure out what's actually going on and then what we might be able to do about it so that we don't have a, a downward spiral or we miss our opportunity uh, to act with with knowledge and wisdom in the moment, and maybe Greg, maybe I think we've gone on longer because of all these t crazy tangents uh, than we had uh, been planning to. But we still have a, some important uh, aspects of assessing the media landscape and going into the crucial uh, Shapiro uh, Jordan Peterson uh, arrival in Jerusalem and what it means about the about the actual. Uh, intellectual moment uh and maybe we should just sort of save some of that for a part two of this yeah and i also want to circle back to the discussion around uh, matt gates and the freedom caucus and the um the what we talked of what we what we started to get into earlier about the um the, the converging of interest between the culture war uh, destroy everything elements that are in the um and the vulture capitalists who have long looked to um go after the American uh, safety net in place. And you know, perhaps what you call around a uh, similar term you use around September 11th, the big wedding that may be going on. But well, yeah, that, I think we could come back to these topics in a um, in another episode and get into the dynamics of even like the Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene that's going on here with the new house caucus. And then, then as you talked about the um, this uh, this Daily Wire um, situation and the um, the merging of like Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson with these uh, national with these Zionist uh, nationalists in Israel that are uh, that do go hand in glove I think with the hardline shift in Israel under uh, the crime minister as you uh, call him Benjamin Netanyahu. I agree because the then what we'll do maybe is then unpack the this combination of the political landscape with the media landscape. Uh, with Gates as the tie-in, uh, you know, who basically, you know, comes out of this Freedom Caucus uh, and is, is uh, you know, signaling towards what might be going on there, but then also then appears on Tim Pool, uh, where this there's this battle being mediated by to some extent by Tim Pool of the, um, basically, of the Daily Wire. Uh, then Tim Pool has on Candace Owens, of the Daily Wire, and there's a whole bunch there to unpack that then relates also to Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson in Jerusalem because uh, Candace Owens talks about how she's not going to give up on either one of her very close friends, whether Ye <laughs> or uh, Marissa Strait, I think yeah. her name is, who has now gone from being the chief uh, operations officer of PragerU to now being the uh, CEO of PragerU, a Unit 8200, American-born uh, Jewish woman who then goes to Israel to finish uh, schooling and uh, joins the IDF and becomes an officer of the Israeli NSA Unit 8200, then becomes the CEO of the uh, Prager University, and how that sort of then that, that you know hung between Candace Owens' friends of Ye on one hand, and then Marissa Strait uh, on the other. What that all uh, means, and then Tim Pool actually, I believe, on Monday. He's having the uh, the other the other side of the battle within this uh, sphere. Um, uh, what's his name again? Uh, Stephen Stephen Crowder. Louder with Crowder. Uh, Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Prove me wrong that there's not ninety genders. So there's a there's a beef there, and there's some interesting uh, there's some, some instructive aspects not only about the sort of horseshoe of this sort of quote-unquote alternative upstart media sphere, but also in terms of the questions of media more generally and contracts and tech 
and uh, and what are the solutions to some of these uh, things, and all of that will be uh, in the mix along with uh, people like uh, Tim Pool and the t-shirt the t-shirt salesman. Uh, Steve Bannon's favorite anarchist, Luke Radowski, and then uh, and then Ian and all those. So yeah, it's very heartwarming that uh, Tim Pool's going to try and mediate this heartbreaking um, split between Ben Shapiro and uh, Stephen Crowder. I'm sure you can hear the pain in my voice as I talk about it. <laughs> On that note, though, we will uh, we will be back with uh, part two very soon. All right, all right, very good. All right, thank you, very Greg, very much for holding this together. And thank you, everybody out there. We appreciate you. Antidote, we are out.